Assalamu alaikum dear viewers and peace be upon you all. Welcome to our show on Imam Hussain TV where we will be discussing different aspects of the momentous occasion of Ashura. Today's discussion will be discussing the very important topic of the afterlife versus the world we live in today, um, which is one of the key themes on the Battle of Karbala. Joining us today with some special guests is Sheikh Abbas Banju, um, Sayyid Mohsin Shah, and also some, with some poetry and recitation, um, Muntazir Jafar. To kick off, uh, Sheikh, um, in Islamic thought, we know that we are told we are made for the afterlife, but also God made us with desires. So I want to ask the question, how can we maintain this uh, yearning for the afterlife, but still have desires uh, within us? Sure. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, when we delve into ideology and figure out questions in regards to our existence and factors of success uh, within our life, the mannerism in which uh, we need to live this life and live and attain success in the hereafter. Answers like these, the intellect is dependent upon two divine sources. That is the Quran and the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt. And this is what the Holy Prophet points towards when he says, "In abada." So long as you hold on to the Quran and to the Ahlul Bayt, you shall never go astray. So when it comes to finding direction in life, understanding existence, understanding our role in this world, understanding what our position is after this world, to get to accurate answers, the intellect is dependent upon text which is divinely revealed. So to answer your question, and this is by way of a muqaddimah, introduction. So to answer your question, if we were to look into the Qur'an, you would find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outlines for us our relationship with this world and what the relationship should be with the afterlife. You have many theories within Islamic school of thought when, and outside of Islamic school of thought, whereby you have a school of thought that comes forward and says that you were created for this life and this life only and your existence is for this life only and that's it. This world and this world only. And uh, hence you have this uh, famous acronym that comes up YOLO. Yeah. You only live yeah. once. You only live once. This is it. Enjoy as much as you can. And at the end of the day when you die, um, your body is going to become a part of this earth and the cycle is going to go on so on so forth. You have others within ideolog ideological schools of thought that say you need to shun this entire world, stay away from all the luxuries, on all the niceties of this world in order for you to get to the akhirah, in order for you to become successful and gain victory in the afterlife. Well, if that's the case, then why were we created here to begin with? So you find that depending on which school of thought you uh, you delve towards your idea of life and death and relationship with this world varies in accordance. Hence, we are of the opinion that you have to be with the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt in order to deduce the right conclusion. You find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ibrahim verse number 32 or leading up to verse number 33, Bismillah rahman rahim Allah الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وأنزل من السماء ماء فأخرج به من الثمرات رزقا لكم. It is Allah subhanahu wa taala who created the heavens and the earth, and He brings down the rain from the skies, and as a result of the rain, the crops flourish as sustenance for who لكم. So you find that. The, the uh, foods that we have, the essence of nourishment that we have, you can say, the benefits of this earth are created for who? Lakum, for you to enjoy. And 
And it is him who put forward what is understood from this verse is the rules of density such that the boats and the ships are able to float on the waters and for you to be able to conquer this earth. Everything has been created for you. So the idea is that the earth and the benefits that a person is able to extract from this dunya is for mankind to enjoy. However, you have over here that we enjoy the dunya in order to get to the akhirah. In that, enjoy what Allah has created for you from that which is halal. However, do not make it the focus of your entire existence. Do not be obsessed with everything that this world has to give you. Use what Allah has created from that which is halal in order to attain perfection and attain the akhirah. So we understand from the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt that the dunya is created for us to excel in, to develop ourselves, to reach perfection, and using this dunya as a platform to gain eternal success in the akhirah. Yes, there are times and there are imtihans, divine examinations, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put for us, right in front of us, the test between choosing this dunya or choosing the akhirah. And it is at this point, it is absolutely important for a person to always have what we would say his eye on the ball and never forget the bigger picture that this world is a world which is only temporary and there are tons of verses in the quran that point towards this reality but in essence a person doesn't even need to refer back to the quran to be able to understand this but it is sufficient for us to go to a graveyard find one person who has lived eternally from regular mankind La person's time in this earth is mahdood, is limited. And if this belief is firmly rooted inside your heart, rather than just lip service, a person understands that he's moving towards a greater realm of existence. And he, after this dunya, we still have alam al-barzakh, we still have alam al-raj'a, we have the day of Qiyamah, the day of judgment, which is equivalent to 50,000 years. The single year over there is equivalent to 50,000 years. And after all this, you have eternity in heaven, in paradise, or in hell, depending on the way in which we spent our time and the way in which we spent the resources created by Allah on this earth. Thank you. Sayyid Muslim, just building on that, I mean, in theory, this is, this is an amazing goal for us to have. Um, but practically speaking, how would you say and shine light upon the idea of do, we, do, I, do I have to give up all my desires to, to attain the afterlife or is this balance possible in this busy life we live in nowadays? Oh, Shala, great question. Um, I think that this balance is probably one of the greatest tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has you know, blessed us uh, on, on this earth with. I yeah. mean, if you think about it, yeah, we do understand that we have, you know, we are allowed to enjoy and enjoy the pleasures of this world, which have been, you know, uh, permissible for us by the you know, decree and, and law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, we do have our boundaries to stop us from, you know, I guess, going away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But um, I feel, you know, growing up here in the West, that man really enjoys success. Yeah. And sometimes in that success, they want more success. And that sometimes takes over their heart and it's like material success, whether it's you know, spending extra hours uh, trying to gain more material success than extra hours on the prayer mat or you know, extra hours doing charitable work. Um, and sometimes I think some people are being materialistic where they want the rewards here and now. Yeah. now we live in, in, in a world of you know, on-demand uh, where you can have whatever you want mm -hmm. right on your doorstep <coughs> or right on, on your TV screen or right in front of you with a click of a button. Mm -hmm. Where is the patience gone? Where is the work hard now and receive the reward later? Which Akhira is all based upon, you know? Yeah. And in this world, um, I think it's becoming even more and more challenging, um, especially with the youth, um, with 
you know, this balance between, you know, having material uh, enjoyment and also the enjoyment of Akhara. Um, and I think slowly, slowly as well, people are actually, you know, some people, not all, I hope not my, my community, but a lot of community in general, uh, are losing faith in Akhara. And are thinking maybe, do you know what? Um, there's, you know, I, I want to enjoy myself here and now. YOLO. Who, yeah, yeah, YOLO. And who knows about the hereafter? Mm. Well, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get when there. We get to it, yeah. So yeah. I, that, that, that's how I see yeah. it at the moment. I mean, I mean, I mean, Montezer, I mean, when we look at the, the Battle of Karbala, I mean, one of the big themes is, is people after this world to fight, fight the people who are after the afterlife. Um, are there any figures who you can relate to the most when it comes to this ideology? I mean, we've got, for example, uh, Qasim, the nephew of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, who said that very famous poetic phrase where death is sweeter to him than honey. Um, are there any other figures that you, you uh, look at that inspire you to look towards the afterlife more than this life? For me, one of the, <coughs> one of the, people's that's, one of the people that stand out is um, a companion of Imam Hussein alayhi salam by the name of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. Yeah. Um, Zuhair was one of the known businessmen and wealthy merchants of, of the city at the time. Um, and what actually happened was he just, he, he happened to be uh, passing through the desert and camping at the same campsite as Abi Abdullah al Hussein yeah. um, when Imam Hussein called him to speak to him. And, and to me, for, for Zuhair to leave behind everything that he had. Um, and in fact, it, it was, it was uh, Sheikh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Zuhair uh, who, meant, who said on the night of Ashura that you can burn us mm. and you can resurrect us and then you can burn us again and we'll still fight Sant. for Abi Abdullah al Hussein. For me, that's, that's very inspiring to leave what you have behind, all the wealth, all the, all the worldly things that you have, but, but in your heart you know that you're going to something better. To have that faith is something that I take huge inspiration from. Absolutely, I think it's a wonderful example. I think, Sheikh, bringing it back to um, what I mentioned earlier about this, this seems to be um, a, a battle between people of this world versus the afterlife. I mean, I've seen myself um, certain, maybe small um, group of people who said that Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, rose just for the sake of it. Um, some even I've seen um, forgive me for saying that he was wrong to rise against the Caliph of the time. Sure. Um, can you shed light upon maybe proving the fact that Imam Hussein did rise with the afterlife in mind and that Yazid was all about this world? How can you prove that Yazid was about this world? It, was, it wasn't for Islam, whereas Imam Hussein was. Um, you know, as a quick uh, comment on, uh, uh, on what you have said that in regards to um, scholars or authors across the passage of time, uh, having written verdicts and judging the revolution of Imam al Hussein. Uh, you find that, unfortunately, there have been a lot of scholars across time who have either been funded or have been affected by the school of Bani Abbas and Bani Umayyah, who have come forward and have distorted uh, the divinity and the position of Imam al Hussein when it comes to the revolution uh, of Imam al Hussein. And there's plenty of uh, evidence of this, even when we return back to the books, Khasatan, uh, particularly the books of the Amma. However, a very simple answer in this regard. You have hadith from hadith and Quran in which the entire Muslim world agrees upon. The revelation of the verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجَّ أَحْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَحِّرَكُمْ تَطْحِيرًا Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad بِإِجْمَاءِ المسلمين. Without any exception, the entire Muslim world, scholars from the Muslim world, regardless of their sects, are undisputed in the fact that Imam al Hussein was under the kisa when this verse was revealed to Rasulullah. You look at the sources from the Amma as well as the Khasa. You could have disputes whether the wives are part of this or not. However, what is established is that Amir al-Mu'mineen 
سيدة فاطمة الزهراء عليها السلام إمام حسن المجتمع عليه السلام عند إمام الحسين عليه السلام was definitely under the kisa and this verse was definitely revealed upon them without a doubt they are, with a, they are part of the Ahlul Bayt everybody else we could have debates and disagreements and there is proofs for and against this is a discussion for another time but what is established is that the Imam al Hussein is part of that Ahlul Bayt and this verse of the Quran denotes the infallibility of Imam al Hussein so when we understand that Imam al Hussein is infallible and a part of infallibility dictates that because you are sinless you have your entire existence revolves around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your entire existence revolves around Allah so to question Imam al Hussein, whether he was right or wrong if he was wrong yani that means Allah ordained infallibility on a person who is not capable or deserving and that means there is a naqs wal ayadu billah shortcoming in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you find that the issue of Imam al Hussein is absolutely sensitive in that you can understand the level of divinity attached to Imam al Hussein. In that, just from this one verse of the Quran, you have another verse uh, or you have another hadith from uh, the Holy Prophet, uh, peace be upon him and his progeny. And this is a hadith, again, which is accepted, unanimously accepted by all Muslims across all schools of thought, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, Husaynu minni wa ana min al Hussein. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Ahabballahu man ahabba Husayna. When the Prophet says, Husaynu minni, Hussein is from me. Maybe we can say, yes, this is an expression of the biological relationship. He is the grandfather. But what about when Rasulullah says, Wa ana min al Hussein, I am from Hussein. Mm. So we understand from here that the relationship is not something which is strictly biological. It is a relationship which extends and exceeds a blood relationship. And this is a relationship in regards to the message of Allah Azza wa Jal. So when Rasulullah says, I am from Hussein, and I want to understand, did Hussein fight for the dunya or for the akhirah? Did Rasulullah come for dunya or akhirah? Mm -hmm. He came for akhirah. And he says, Hussein is from me. So because Rasulullah is all about the akhirah, is all about virtuousness and righteousness in its entirety, Hussein is from that. Imam al Hussein is from that virtuousness, he's from that righteousness. These are hadith which are undisputed in that essence. And these are just two very simple examples. And if we were to delve into history in Karbala, step by step, why would Imam al Hussein, if he was about gaining this dunya, go into a f forsaken desert with his family members? Why? Mm. If he was about this dunya, what was there to stop him from give, pledging allegiance to Yazid and then getting a big part of the government? He would have pledged allegiance and he would have been given a part of become the governor of this area or that area. You know, this is a common tactic of the dictators, of, their, uh, of, of dictators across the passage of time that when you have an opposition, rather than have an open opponent, buy him into your fold so that he doesn't oppose you. It could have happened. Yet you find Imam al Hussein was insistent that no matter what the level of persecution was, he's going to stand up. Stand up for what? Principles. Mm -hmm. A person. This is a rule of thumb that you and I need to keep in heart. It allows us to identify truth in our daily lives. And these are rules of thumbs of life. Nobody will withstand persecution if they are in pursuit of the dunya. No, this is a rule of thumb. Person cracks. If you are going for the dunya, there is a level of an imtihan. Mm -hmm. As soon as a certain amount of hardship, you hit this level of hardship, you are going to abandon it. Mm -hmm. Because the human mind always thinks in a cost-benefit analysis frame. Mm -hmm. My benefit is this dunya. 
what is the cost of me achieving this dunya in terms of physical punishment, persecution, this or that. The minute I see the persecution is greater than that benefit, I leave it. But when I'm thinking about persecution in the dunya as opposed to the akhirah, this is why you have guys like Zuhair ibn al-Qain say, even if you were to resurrect me 70 times over and burn me and scatter my ashes, I would still come back. Why? Because this cost is nothing in comparison to the akhirah, in comparison to the values for which they are standing for. And these are just but minor simple proofs mm. to show that there is absolutely uh, not an ounce of a doubt in regards to the divinity for which Imam al Hussein stood for. And more important or as important is the fact that anyone who opposed Imam al Hussein signifies batil, falsehood, and tyranny in its entirety. I think just building on that, it's just made me think that if we put aside textual sources, sometimes when we look towards history and look at such figures with such certainty in the afterlife, that enough is proof for us that there is an afterlife. Mm -hmm. That if someone is willing to die and put everything on the line and see no benefit in this world for a higher cause, um, that in itself can prove the after. I mean, Muntaz and Say Muslim, feel free to chip in here. Ha how do we get to the stage, and I find it quite scary myself, um, living in this day, how do we get to the stage where someone is able to actually... We know that Yazid, for example, offered several positions and properties and, and governments to certain people to fight against the Imam. I mean, how do we get to the stage where we prefer that over a divine reward? I mean, everyone on the other side did claim to be Muslim. I'm sure they read the Quran, and I'm sure, you know, we know they, they used to pray five times a day, even do the night prayer, some of them. How do we get to the stage where you can, you can abandon the afterlife for the sake of a temporary pleasure? I think it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to, be, to have that faith um, where you can, you can turn down a position in this world. That's what the word faith means, isn't it? Yeah. That leap into the unknown. I think, yeah. I think it's... it's like if you explain to to somebody who who doesn't grasp the concept of religion or religiosity, yeah. that I'm not doing this because I don't think this person is correct. I don't think he's on the right path. I'm not serving a tyrannical leader, and for fear of the punishment of the afterlife, to them it's a very foreign concept. Yeah. But it, it's all about the faith that you hold, uh, and I think it's it's easier than 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 we make it sound um, to to be tempted by this world. Um, we say every week in, in, on the Thursday night in Dark Kumail that this world has deceived me. Yeah. Mm. Right? I've been Sorry. deceived by this world. Um, and I, now I find nowhere to go except to come to you, mm. to my Lord. Right? And it's very easy to fall into the trap of I want to do this and I want this position and people are going to look at me favorably if I do this and this is good for my reputation, this is good for my ego. Right? And I think sometimes it's a lot easier than we make it sound. We make it sound like these people were, they were very evil, they were, they were on the wrong side on that day. But sometimes it goes back to whether or not we can confidently say that we would have been on the right side. Mm. Say most, what, if some, what if someone says to you, and please say what you were going to say, but even to act, what if someone says to you, that was blind faith? What happened there? It was blind faith. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to answer because the certainty that's there in, Indeed, the indeed, and I think sometimes we forget um, that you know, it's not just about akhirah mm. but it's about having a stand on principles and morality and ethical values and Let's not forget that Imam Hussein, he knew Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he knew that if power was to fall into the hands of Yazid Islam would have been forgotten there would be no, forget Shia, there would be no Sunni Islam, there would be no Adhan, there would be no prayer, there would be no Qur'an. Mm. In order to preserve the message of Rasulullah you know, Imam Hussein had to put a stand towards that. So it was, there, there was a bigger mission. On top of that, looking at you know, what was necessary was for him to give up you know, what we hold so valuable to ourselves, materialistic, our lives, our family, uh, and things like that. He gave that up for the sake of Islam and for the sake of Akhira. Um, furthermore, what I wanted to add on to what Brother uh, yes. you know, Raja, uh, was saying there was that um, 
you were mentioning that you know there were Muslims on that side as well who used to pray and used mm. to read Quran and stuff like that. You know, uh, how could they be you know, go towards such a, a dunya? I think the main thing that these people were, were missing <coughs> was the wali of Amir al Mu'minin, mm. which is one of the most important things, which really separates a lot of people from Akhirah and this dunya, mm. is the wali. And, and a lot of these people had enmity towards uh, Amir al Mu'minin, and this is why they wanted vengeance of, of what happened from to the them and from their yeah. forefathers yeah. and from their tribes and what Amir al Mu'minin has done. Um, and that, that is what kind of tipped the scales, you could say. Mm. Um, and, and that is what really, you know, forced people to do follow their des worldly desire yeah. passions and it was that hate you just, that you, you just reminded me in terms of those those who love Imam Ali, peace be upon him how Hur changed yeah, in the last Yeah, exactly, moment. it's a perfect example I mean, you've had, it look, Hur is a perfect example because he has dunya and akha right in front of him Yeah, he says it, doesn't he? Yeah. I see heaven and hell in front of me Exactly and he was like, oh, the food is good with the, you know, the Umayyads, mm. but the prayer is sweet mm. with the Imam Hussein. Mm. Um, so he had that greatest uh, challenge right in front of him. And let's not forget, you know, Hur, uh, you know, alayhi salam, never had enmity towards Imam Hussein or the Ahlul Bayt. In fact, he was just doing his job. Doing his job, I was going to say. He, he, he changed when he found out that they were going to kill him. He was like, what, what do you mean you're going to kill him? How, how can you kill him? What, mm. what are you talking about? And that's when he, when he, you know, when he found out, and he was like convinced these law are actually gonna go and kill. That's when he started to like value his life and value his akhirah, mm. and think, you know what, this is totally wrong. I'm not, I'm not with this, you know, and and and, ch and changed his um, his his stance, mm. you could say. So that battle is always amongst us. But when it, you know, when 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 it comes to the reality of things, inshallah, we can all make the correct choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sheikh, maybe to. To wrap up the discussion, um, do you have any sayings from either Imam Hussein or any of the, the Holy Family of the Prophet, peace be upon them all, that really sticks with you and maybe we can learn from about embedding this world and looking at this afterlife, looking at the bigger picture as you, as you mentioned. Is there anything that comes to your mind straight away? The words of Imam al Hussein, uh, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayh, uh, when he reached the land of Karbala, he wrote a letter and uh, the letter is a literally a sentence or a two sentence letter where if you were to translate this he says it is as if this world never existed wow <laughs> Akhira is still in its oh, eternity, in its flair, which makes you understand when, when you look at the words of Imam al Hussein and you look real quick into the words of Nabi Nuh, a prophet who lived for the longest time 2,500 years in total, Nabi Nuh, when Malakul Maut was coming to take his soul, he said to Malakul Maut, standing under the sun, can you let me come under the shade of a tree before you extract my soul? Malakul Maut, yani the permission of Allah, gave him permission. He moved under the tree. So as Malakul Maut is going to extract the soul of Nabi Nuh, Malakul Maut asks him, Nabi Ullah Nuh, you've lived 2,500 years. How did you feel this time in the dunya? Nabi Nuh says to him, it passed as quickly as how it took me from coming under the sun to into the shade. Wow. Life passes like this. And I must say a number of things over here uh, to, before you wrap up. That when we are understanding and when we want to seek inspiration from Imam al Hussein, what we need to understand is that this life is temporary and we have a greater realm of existence awaiting for us. This is one. Number two, it's asking ourselves, what have we been created for? What is my purpose? What is the purpose of my existence in this temporary world? Because if I understand this, it will help me put into perspective this balance and this constant battle between seeking the dunya and the akhirah. 
Number three, uh, to add on what uh, Sayyid Mohsin mentioned for Hore bin Yazid al-Riyahi. And this is inspiration for us to take change in our life or to make change in our life. Making change in life requires courage. Mm. Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, correct, he was doing his job, but he was not any normal warrior. He was a celebrated general or commander within one of the greatest battalions that the Islamic Ummah had seen at that time. A celebrated military officer with unmatchable credentials when it came to bravery on the battlefield, with unmatched credentials when it came to strategy of war, and even more, he had unmatched credentials when it came to the art of negotiation in warfare. Mm. Dalil for this is where? The fact that he was appointed by Ibn Sa'ad, uh, the fact that he was appointed by Ubaidullah Ibn Ziyad to go and intercept Imam al Hussein. So Imam al Hussein is leaving Mecca to go towards Kufa, where Ibn Ziyad has just managed by deceit to quash the revolution of Muslim bin Akil. You're coming to intercept an army which is perceived to be the greatest threat to the so-called Khalif of the time. So who are you going to select to head that army? A person like Hor. It shows you his credentials and his standing and you may see whether it is from articles or television shows or whatever it is, the culture of living in a family that has served within the military. You have these, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you could say, customs and cultures of how you portray yourself. Honor. honor, men of honor, exactly. How you portray yourself when you come from a family that serves in the Royal Navy or in the army. There's a certain way you hold yourself. There's a certain way you're perceived. Hor mm -hmm. ibn Yazid al-Riyahi had this social status being the chief of a, or the commander of a battalion and an army to switch sides and this is viewed as mutiny from a social perspective, from a career perspective. But it took courage to side with truth. When you recognize truth, si recognizing truth is one thing. Siding with truth is another thing altogether. It's a consequence of that recognition. And this takes courage. We look ourselves in our daily lives, see, trying to seek inspiration from Hor, trying to seek inspiration from Zuhair ibn al Qayn. These are words that are easy to say. These are sacrifices that were adim. What we do is we see what can we take from their life in our daily lives today. When I see injustice happening today in the times that I live, if I see things that are happening wrong within my community, within my Husseiniyah, within my Imam Barga, I see oppression that is happening. I see injustice that is happening. I see distortion of the religion that is happening. Do I have the courage to stand up and take a stance? Even if you lose your Even if I lose. Even if I lose my credentials and my social standing. Do I have that courage or not? This is where it begins. Making changes at the grassroots. The areas in which we live. The domains or the spheres in which we are able to exert influence from the madrasa to the bar. There are so many injustices that happen. So much distortion of the religion, so on and so forth. Locally that happens. Yeah. Nobody, nobody stands up because of the fear of the consequences. What happens is, in life, in order to make a stance, you need human being needs a catalyst, like in a chemical reaction. Yeah. You need a catalyst to trigger change. 
human being needs a catalyst that will trigger change and allow him to take stances. What is that catalyst? Karbala. Mm -hmm. Teaches you to be fearless. When it comes to taking stances in your own domain. And as you progress, the stances that you take become greater, 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 until we pave the way for the dhuhur of Imam Sahib al-Amri wa Thank you. Um, to wrap up today's discussion, we are going to, as tradition uh, obviously demands in the morning of Imam Hussain, to have some poetry. So uh, Brother uh, Muntaz has <coughs> prepared some poetry to recite um, related to today's topic. Um, so please, Brother Muntaz, um, you can serve now. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> so um, I've prepared some uh, poetry re with regards to the battle of the Akhirah and Dunya that we normally face. We see with the eyes, but they saw with their heart, gave up this world for an even bigger part in the hereafter. We're so blinded by this world and all that it has to offer that we fail to think and we hardly ever ponder. See, what we do here is an investment, the returns of which you'll see on the day that all people are identified by their deeds. And on that day, if your business flourishes, then glad tidings to you, for heaven is your abode. But in this world, if by your hands the seeds of evil were sowed, then await the hereafter, for with God lies your fate. Try as you will, you can never anticipate what will be yours. So be like those companions who fought for Hussein. Their lives were nothing in comparison to their gain, for they pleased the heart of our mother Zahra. So heaven awaits them and upon them my salam. So heaven awaits them and upon them my salam. Thank you dear viewers for joining us in today's discussion. Um, it is very clear to see that all of us in our life will have times where we have to choose between picking this world versus the afterlife. Um, and there's no one better to learn from than with the story of Imam Hussein. There are several companions we've discussed who chose eternity over being mortals. And with that, we close the discussion. Thank you to all of our guests for joining us today. We hope you benefit from it uh, greatly. Um, and we will see you next time. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Yeah.